Hello, happy Monday. It is April the 27th and we are continuing to celebrate National Poetry Month for this last week of April. Uh, we're going to do a little combination this week. Uh, we're going to look at film and poetry in combination, especially on Monday and Tuesday of today. Uh, we've got a film and a poem uh, on Monday and Tuesday. The short little assessment due at the end of the day on Tuesday. It's to complete a slide. I'll go over that in this video. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday, you'll have two more poems that you'll analyze, and then you'll take an assessment on Thursday in a Google form. It'll just be answering questions. And then on Friday, we will have a journal entry. So again, our same structure. We read and analyze Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We assess on Thursday, and we write on Fridays. So hope you had a good weekend. Um, our goals, our point of doing, uh, you know, the poetry and the assessments is to practice these skills. You know, how well are you um, at analyzing text, meaning analyze means to break it down and look at it, individual parts. You know, are you looking at word choice? Are you noticing literary devices? Are you noticing the structure? That's really what it means to analyze something is to break down and look at certain elements. And we're going to do that with a short film and a poem uh, for Monday and Tuesday. So you can split this video up into two assignments. Do the film on Monday, do the poem on Tuesday. Uh, at the end of the poem, do the little assessment in the slides. Okay. Uh, we're also trying to determine the theme. What is the poem saying to us? What is the message from the poet? Uh, determine the meaning of words and phrases. Uh, poetry is really important because it is concise. You know, when we look at a poem, we think, oh, it's going to be so easy because it's so, it's, there's less words. It'll be so much easier. Wrong, Rudy. It actually makes it more difficult because each of those words is chosen specifically for its meaning. And sometimes that meaning can have double levels. So when we're reading a poem, there's sort of that surface meaning. And then a lot of times there's like a deeper meaning going on. And this is those things like metaphors, similes that kind of carry it to that deeper level of meaning. That's why poetry is so challenging. You do have to be very specific about your words because you don't get to use very many. The way that you put them in order creates something memorable because it can be lyrical. Um, music, it's why we like music so much. It has that lyrical quality. Poems are musical, you know. So anyway, um, we're going to try to complete the uh, slides that are highlighted here in yellow. That's going to be due on Tuesday. So without further ado, let's jump right in so you can maybe get through today. All right, our first task, notice this is something that we have to do because it's highlighted in yellow, is to watch this short film and then answer these questions. Uh, you can do this on your own if you want, or you can do it with me in the video. Could it be one? 
and high up above or down below. When you're too in love to let it go. But if you never try, you'll never know. Just what's your word? short film. It was amazing. Okay, so who were our characters? We had sort of groups of characters. We had the lovers, right? Uh, we had the man uh, with a wish, right? And then we had the underground worker okay so we had those um characters going on our story was um people made wishes and the underground worker made them come true look at me not not typing i'm the worst typer in the world Okay, so, um, and then, you know, the lovers um, encounter a problem and the underground worker must solve it, which he does in the end. Okay. Short little event there. That was our opening, you know, we had our characters, their conflict was they made a wish, but something happened where the wish couldn't come true. And through a series of events with the underground worker working furiously behind the scenes, um, their wish comes true. And of course, you know, our man who 
dropped the coin in and kept getting all the money. He plays a part in it as well. The theme. So I think that we need to really think about all the elements going on. This is that double layer that I'm talking about. So on the surface, again, it looks like, you know, um, the underground workers, the ho-hum job, you know, he just grants wishes and he just got buttons there that he just pushes. Uneventful life. And it looks like maybe he feels like his life doesn't really have a whole lot of purpose. You notice him sleeping on the job and he's just like very humdrum about it, especially because the first guy asks for money, you know, when he throws his coin in and then all of these coins start appearing everywhere. So then we had the two lovers come and they throw their coins in and there's, you know, it's problematic. Ah, all of a sudden our underground worker has something to do. He has purpose. He, you know, and love is the, you know, the one wish that seems to be the most important because that's the one where he has to bring out the emergency equipment from the wall and go up and try to save the day. And so I think that um, that, you know, in and of itself is part of that, that underlying meaning. So on the surface, we have, hey, you know, you have to be patient for your dreams to come true. That's the story of the couple. The two lovers have to patiently wait for the right time. That's a lesson that maybe sometimes our dreams don't immediately come true because other things have to happen first. And, you know, that idea of destiny about things that are meant to be will happen in their own time. But then we've got that underlying, like, you know, that things are going on underground outside of our control that are working towards us and that second underlying message is about the underground worker and the man who had gotten all the money they played such significant parts in the lover story and the lovers never even knew it and so our actions do influence other people to um do the noble thing and work towards helping others. Notice the little underground worker worked towards making sure the couple got their wish. The man who had gotten all the money was the one who supplied the coin, which made it possible for the underground worker to succeed. So we have that a whole underground story there going on about how it benefits us to help other people. In fact, that is part of our mission in life. So maybe the theme here is dreams um, take patience and let me move myself, sorry. Um, and what is going <laughs> Okay. And um, let's see. And uh, Dreams take patience. Um, and then our other message would be that um, maybe people influence our lives every day and we never know it. Something like that, you know? Um, but again, dreams here have a very positive connotation. We think of them as good, something that we want to have come true. Okay, so now would be a good time to pause the video. If you're gonna work on Monday and Tuesday, this is where you would pause for today because you've done today's work. This is really what I would consider Monday's work. So if you wanna bow out right now, you can pause me, that would be my pause face. Okay, if you're not, if you're trekking through with me today so that you don't have to work tomorrow, we're gonna move on to the poem, and the poem is called Dream Deferred. Um, some things about this poem, it's got 11 lines. I went ahead and numbered these for you. Uh, it has some structure, but we're gonna have to do some really deep reading to figure it out. This poem is written by Langston Hughes. He lived in the early 1900s, was born in 1902, died in 1967. He was part of something called the Harlem Renaissance Movement. So before we left for spring break, we were studying the civil rights movement. 
that happened, you know, in the 50s and 60s here in the United States. And um, we read Letter from Birmingham Jail and we listened to I Have a Dream. So Martin Luther King uh, helped us understand things about the civil rights movement. This is the precursor to the civil rights movement. This is the Harlem Renaissance movement. Um, so prior to that, you had um, a large portion, it's called the Great Migration. You had a large portion of African Americans moving from rural settings into urban settings, into cities, specifically Harlem. And so when you had all of those people merging into one community, um, you had a lot of different cultures influencing each other. Um, and so the Harlem Renaissance really focuses on the culture that was um, seen in Harlem, but in other cities too. It focused on the black experience and it, we can see it communicated in art from that era. Uh, theater, there were a lot of plays written, um, literature written during the Harlem Renaissance, music. So again, all of these sought to capture what it felt like to be um, black and live in America at that time. All right, so this one, like our, fur, or like our film from earlier, is about a dream or a wish, something that we really want and desire. So um, when we are reading this poem today, we are going to look for a few things. Our annotating and analyzing is gonna take place on a document. I want you to try to do this, really. Um, spend some time highlighting some information in a document for me. Um, really work on trying to find things uh, in, a, in a poem. Things that you're gonna look for, simile, this is that indirect comparison. She eats like a hog. Notice the word like, okay? And I'm comparing hogs and a girl and her eating habits. I could be maybe talking about myself. All right, metaphor. This is a direct comparison. We don't use like or as. We say she is a hog. We actually call her something else. Symbolism. This is when an object represents a bigger idea. It goes beyond just the basic meaning. So for example, with this hog, we could mean that she is greedy. You know, we t whenever we call someone a pig, sometimes we're talking about how they are greedy and they take more than they should. Rhyme schemes. Um, this is where we look at the last word at the end of each line of poetry and find the ones that go together. And it creates a pattern. We call that pattern of rhyming a rhyme scheme. So we'll look at this more in depth in the poem, but this is how you write a rhyme scheme out if you're talking about it. Meter, this is how long the lines are, and this is what gives them sort of that musical quality. It's the beat. Da-da, da-da, da-da. Da-da, da-da, da-da. Da-da, da-da, da-da. So they're the same length and they have the same beat. So that's meter of, of poetry. And then the theme, of course, is really important because all poems really have a message for us. So what is the poet trying to tell us in his poem? All right, so after we're gonna go analyze this poem really quick, and then when we come back, this is gonna be our final assessment due at the end of the day on Tuesday. We're gonna fill in these three boxes, okay? So let's take a moment though and go analyze um, our poem. Um, uh, computer's going crazy right now. Okay. Uh, go away. Uh, I think my poem's right here. Okay. So how do we analyze a poem? Well, we're going to go through and we're going to highlight. So we want to do the rhyme schema in yellow. Um, and then we want to see, you know, is there meter here? Are these lines, do they sound sort of the same length? Um, if you can't find the meter or the rhyme scheme, don't freak out. This is your first go around with poetry. So these are hard. These are difficult to find, but you just were scratching the surface. I want you to at least start to notice them or try to notice them. So if you don't do all this highlighting perfectly, 
that's the point. You're practicing. You're trying to figure out how to do it. We're going to highlight words in green, and then we're going to look for figurative language in um, sort of this aqua color. It's one of my favorite colors. Um, then we can write questions and insights and draw conclusions kind of over here in the margins in like a blue or a gray color. So yellow, green, turquoise, and blue are kind of what we're going to try to do. And we're going to do it to this poem right here. Okay. And then there's some questions down here at the bottom where you can go in and type answers to the things that maybe you should have been noticing. Okay. So this one is going to be sitting in there for you. It says student copy. This is the one for you to practice on. You know, can you not do this? You certainly can. I, you know, but again, that's not going to make you a better reader. It's not going to prepare you for 10th grade English to not be analyzing stuff. So I encourage you to try. If you're wrong, okay. It's fine. You're practicing. All right, so for those of you though that are going through with me, let me go ahead and point out um, how to do this. All right, so here we go. A Dream Deferred by Langston Hughes. Again, we know he's part of the Harlem Renaissance. We know that he is trying to capture um, what it's like to be a black person in America at this time. Okay, that's, that's what the Harlem Renaissance, that's what that was all about. That movement. Okay. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? So this one is full of lots of images and I tried to divide them up by changing the font. So what I kind of saw was these first four lines go together. And I noticed that because run and sun match. This is um, a question. It starts with does it. I noticed that I saw does it two times. So that tells me that, that there's parallel structure here. And whenever I see parallel structure, I know I'm dividing ideas up. Like it's creating a list for me. That's how parallel structure works. It helps us organize and separate ideas. And so I see that in here. So I know that this is posing my first rhetorical question. And again, a rhetorical question is a question that you're really not meant to answer, but you should be thinking about the answer. And I have this image, these two images here, and then I've got another image right here, okay? So the first image is, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? So I've got this image of, a, you know, a raisin is like a shriveled up grape. It's no longer full of life and, you know, um, it's now just sort of dried out on its last leg. Then we have, or fester like a sore and then run. Same thing you know, something that over time has just now gotten into a terrible state, uh, like an infected state where it's like oozing. That's what the run is. It's like oozing pus or something. So again, both of these images are of something that has gone on for too long and now it's, it's in a bad state. Shift it to a new idea. Does it See, there's that repeated. So this is in another font. So you can do that that way. Change the font of the words to change the ideas. Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? So here we have references to food and um, stink like rotten meat. Again, appealing to our senses here, that sense of smell or um, something like I don't know if y'all have ever opened up like honey and it's kind of gotten crusty around the top or syrup for pancakes and it's kind of gotten crusty where it's been exposed to air. That's this image here, our crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Um, and again, we have that rhyme. So we know that these three lines go together. So here we have four lines. Here we have three lines of poetry that go together. 
again, all of these ideas are kind of related because they're referring to food. Um, and why food? Why is food important? It's the sustenance of life. Without it, you'll die. So, you know, again, a symbol or a metaphor for something um, bigger than itself. Then we have these last ideas. So we've got one here going on these two lines. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. It's bending beneath the weight of something. Again, you can visualize that. Sometimes you can even feel it. I mean, think of your backpacks. I've seen some of your backpacks. Good golly, Miss Molly, can they get any bigger books in there? So, you know, that heavy carrying um, and weighting you down where it almost kind of like bends your back. Again, a very visual image, but one that we can feel because we've all carried something heavy on our backs before, whether it was real, like a big backpack, or metaphorical, something like guilt or shame uh, or sadness. Those are heavy and can sometimes cause us to stumble and fall. I want you to notice here how we've gone through these ideas four lines, three lines two lines and now we're to the final um line and again it's its own image or does it there's that does it again right here explode and explode we learned ex the first semester of school it means out um so the word explode means everything moves outward very violently to implode, I am means things blow up inward, but this is explode. So things just break out and bust out very violently. Again, images of what he thinks might happen to the dreams of people who never see their dream come true. Dream deferred means that word deferred means to put off or postpone. And so these are what happens when a dream doesn't come true. It, you know, loses its life and turns into a shriveled up grape or an oozing sore. It begins to ruin like rotten meat or um, syrup that's turning all crusty. It's losing its life. Again, it's no longer any good. It's breaking under the heaviness of never coming true. It's really heavy. And then finally we have this, it just explodes. It's this violent reaction uh, because it's probably, you know, it can't take the pressure anymore. And so it explodes. So, oh my gosh, y'all, that is so much information packed into 11 lines. And look how short these lines are. Um, again, this is amazing that it is um, structured with the ideas slowly dwindling down to one line. So four in the first stanza really, three, we could consider this the second stanza, two in what would be considered the third stanza, and one in what would be considered the fourth stanza amazing form. All right, so let's talk about it a little bit. Um, so what is a dream deferred? And we said the word deferred um, means that you put it off. For example, if you ever talk to anyone in college and you say, hey, how are your student loans? And they say, I'm really hoping to defer them. It means that they don't want to pay on them immediately. They would like to not pay on them for a while. So that, what, that's what it means to defer. Um, so a dream deferred is a dream that has been delayed or postponed. Our first image here is of a raisin shriveled up or a sore not healing. Again, something that is losing its life. Um, the second image uh, is of meat rotting and, and smelling and of syrup that's turning into the sugary substance, kind of crunchy. Again, it's no longer good to eat. It's past its prime. Uh, the third image is of something that it's it's really heavy and it's sagging underneath the weight. And then we have the final image of a violent explosion. And again, he does these um, in, in really corresponding standards or stanzas working his way downward. 
the devices that we saw used, we saw a simile like a raisin, like a sword. We also saw a metaphor or does it explode? Life is like a, you know, or a dream deferred is like a bomb and it will explode. That disappointment will cause an explosion. Imagery, we have that dried up raisin or that crested over sugary. Um, and you can kind of know what that looks like. It looks like big grains of crunchy sugar. We have a rhetorical question going on, and this is that parallel structure that moves us through these ideas. Does it, does it, does it? How can we connect to this literature? Again, we said that Langston Hughes was a member of the Harlem Renaissance. This would have been about what it was like to be an African-American in the early 1900s, like 1920s, probably 1930s. Um, this poem was published though in 1951. So he has lived through all this experience by the time he wrote this poem. And how does he feel about dreams? You know, when you think about it, getting a new lease on life, moving to a new city, like the Harlem Renaissance was about, again, moving to a city where you think, okay, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities here. Reading this poem, it seems like maybe those opportunities did not come to fruition. They did not come true. Again, 1951, shortly after that, we start to see Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. And we know he expressed similar frustrations in his letter from Birmingham jail and his speech, I have a dream. So this was building up and we know that because this poem allows us to see before Martin Luther King's pieces that this experience was still a frustrating experience. So putting it together and connecting it with other um, pieces of literature is important. It creates a better picture for us. This is why art is important. It tells us what was life really like for people during a certain age. They write about it. We read about it. We infer. We get information and make a decision about what we think it was like. All right. If we were going to write about this literature, like if we were going to, you know, do sort of a, a short little analysis of what we think about the poem, we would use some key words to talk about the theme. Key words that I associate with this theme are delay. That's what deferred means sadness you know again everything sort of past its prime hopeless you can't go back and like you know a raisin can't go back and become a grape again anger that's that explosion kind of carries that with me that frustration so these would be words that would help me draft um what i think the theme might be so here's what mine might sound like in what happens to in, to a dream deferred? You always have to name the piece. Don't forget that. Your audience doesn't know just what you're talking about. So in what happens to a dream deferred, comma, Langston Hughes uses imagery and figurative language to show how an oppressed people can turn from passivity to violence if not allowed to pursue their God-given rights. So um, I found, you know, this to be um a good analysis of what this sounds like right do you agree i think he does use and i did find this um you know but you would always start it with the name of the piece maybe what the poet is trying to do and how you interpreted that so there's kind of like three parts to this um, so he does use imagery and figurative language. We said that right here, rhetorical questions, imagery, metaphor, simile, all that's figurative language. How does he use that figurative language? He shows us how people, you know, just are silent and let their dreams ruin their lives and then finally explode. They get mad and angry and they want what's theirs, right? Okay, so based on that, go back now and fill out your slide here. Well, how were 
the film and the poem different. That's what contrast means. So tell me they were both about dreams, but so you can even say that both the film and the poem were about dreams, but the film, tell me what it does. And the poem, because I think they dealt with dreams in very different ways. Here, you're going to identify a part uh, of the film and tell me sort of what does it say about dreams. And then over here, you're going to choose a line from the poem and tell me what does that indicate about dreams. So again, just sort of filling in the blank, final reflection piece. You're going to turn this slideshow back in. And that's a wrap, you guys. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday, we'll be doing two more poems, very much like what we just did, where I want you highlighting on a document, making notes out to the side. That's it, guys. Turn in your slideshow at the end of the day on Tuesday. Bye.